today's topic could not be <laughs> any more pertinent. It's the, um, the role of public health and um, the new school of public health. Um, if the COVID-19 pandemic has taught us anything, it's the importance of public health in our lives. Today, we are exciting to, to introduce um, the new dean of the uh, Herbert Wertheim School of Public Health, Dr. Cheryl Anderson. She will share some of her ideas about what a 21st century school of public health should look like and how it can contribute um, through um, prevention, behavioral, epidemiologic, and clinical research and education. We are also very fortunate to have two experts at the forefront of this um, pandemic, Dr. Harvey Feinberg and San Diego County Supervisor Nathan Fletcher, who will talk about their individual perspectives from a national and local level as we continue um, to combat COVID-19. Unfortunately, um, Nathan has an emergency closed session um, um, at this very moment, but he was able to record some answers to the questions you've asked us previously. So we'll get a recording from him. So before we start, I want to acknowledge the amazing work and the real heroism of um, the healthcare front care, um, the healthcare workers at UC San Diego and, and throughout the county who have really done an amazing job in um, keeping um, San Diego um, health and the outcomes of the people who have um, COVID-19 have been among the best um, in the country. So um, we are continuing to take care of patients. We're continuing to um, trace um, contacts um, to um, have clinical trials um, for um, new therapies and most recently to be enrolled in um, the three large um, vaccine trials that are ongoing right now. So before um, I introduce our speakers, I wanted to uh, share with you um, a few words from um, Herbert Wertheim. Herbert Wertheim recognized the importance of public health and the unique ability of UC San Diego to be a center um, for um, a new school for public health. And his generosity and encouragement is, is why um, we're here today with a new school. So at first, we're going to hear a, um, an introduction from Herbert Wertheim. Thank you. Hi, my name is Herbert Wertheim. My friends call me Herbie. I love the name Herbie because it's, it's friendly. What I'd like to do is take a few moments to congratulate first Dr. Anderson for her willingness to be the inaugural founding dean of the Herbert Wertheim School of Public Health and Human Longevity. She's a terrific, terrific choice. San Diego has the right stuff, the right infrastructure, the right people, the right attitude. It's a very special place. What we all have in common, all of us, every single one of us, is we have time and our humanity. What we do with those two things defines who we are. So value your time and your humanity and go forth. Those who, who you know, um, Dr. Herbert Wertheim, know his signature red hat. <laughs> so I was glad to see that also. Um, so now it's my pleasure to introduce Cheryl Anderson. Um, she was recently named the inaugural dean for the Herbert Wertheim School of Public Health and Human Longevity Science. She was previously the interim chair of the Department of Family Medicine and Public Health. She's a professor and a director of the UC San Diego Center of Excellence in Health Promotion and Equity. She is a renowned researcher. Um, she's interested in nutrition and prevention of cardiovascular disease, chronic kidney disease, and diet-related cancers. She serves on several um, national boards and advisory groups, and she's a member of the um, National Academy of Medicine. Please join me in, um, in welcoming um, Dr. Cheryl Anderson, and she'll tell us about the new School of Public Health. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, uh, Vice Chancellor Brenner, for that beautiful introduction and for hosting today's Health Talks. I also want to say to those of you who took the time to join us today that you know, we continue to be inspired by you. We love that you uh, come and listen and hear and share the story of what's going on here at UC San Diego. And I thank you uh, up front for all of the support that you continue to give us uh, as an institution. So today you've come to learn about uh, public health and what's going on here um, at UC San Diego. 
Thank you, Dr. Wertheim, who uh, has joined us this morning, who gave us that beautiful video for having the vision uh, and the ability to really give us a transformative gift in the space of public health. This comes at a time when we have a chancellor and a vice chancellor for health sciences who share um, that vision that you have, um, that this is the right direction to take our health sciences. I remember, um, you know, eight years ago when I started here at UC San Diego as an associate professor, that I became the director of a new undergraduate program in public health. And I told the students when they showed up on the first day of class that this is something that is a calling for people who are okay with having a profession where people don't really see you, right? When public health is working well, you don't see it. And we draw often uh, people who come to it with humil humility, compassion, the ability to serve uh, those who are in greatest need without really getting much recognition for it. It isn't until uh, something big happens, for example, pandemic SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19, uh, when people really start to talk about public health at the dinner table. And at those times, uh, often, you know, times of crisis, HIV, AIDS, Ebola, um, we, we hear about our Centers for Disease Control, our World Health Organization, and these other um, really great public health forces, and we, we begin to have the, the, the conversation. But with this initiative at UC San Diego that started back when everything was quiet, back when uh, public health wasn't an everyday word, uh, we were really able to plan and prepare for some really exciting things. And so I'm really um, happy this morning to be able to tell you a little bit about where we are, tell you about the plans that we have and um, what that journey ahead of us might look like. So in 2019, our regents gave us the approval to, to start a, a school of public health. And we also got this beautiful gift um, from the Herbert Wertheim and, and Nicole Wertheim Family Foundation. And with that, we set our sights on doing uh, a few things. Things that we thought would distinguish us from the other 177 schools and programs of public health in the country. And those include looking across uh, UC San Diego campus, looking across our region and saying, what can make us really special? We have a Scripps Institution of Oceanography that's world-class. Um, very few other universities in this country or world can uh, claim to have that kind of oceanography program aligned with it. And so the ability for us to study things like climate and public health and to really make an impact in that, uh, that part of, of, of public health need uh, will be a distinctive uh, factor as we move forward. We also have a world-class school of engineering that allows us to think about wireless and mobile technologies and how we might engage those in, in solving public health problems. And again, you know, that's something that uh, others will do. We think that we'll be uh, one of the best doing it. We happen to have in San Diego, the largest border community um, with Tijuana and Mexicali uh, right here at our border and the ability to think about infections uh, to think about modern day chronic disease uh, challenges in a uh, border context is something that, again, few others can do and would make us really special. Our school, as you may have noticed, has the um, additional uh, uh, context to it of not just being a school of public health, but being a school of public health and human longevity science. And so that call to human longevity science is uh, really about how do we think about successfully getting across the lifespan in a way that optimizes our outcomes. So I think of it as from twinkle to wrinkle, we're doing the kinds of health optimization that allows every citizen, regardless of where you live, where you learn, where you work, where you play, where you pray, um, to have their attain their highest uh, level of health possible. And so those are just some uh, key ideas about uh, where we want to go. That's gonna take uh, us sitting down and really thinking about strategy. Um, you know, we're gonna need to take some risks. We're going to need to think about the external environment within which we are building this school as well as what's going on here in our UC environment. So let's talk a little bit about that. So, 
when uh, Vice Chancellor Brenner called me and said, uh, you are our choice for the founding dean of the School of Public Health, and we'd love it um, if you come on this journey with us. I looked up and I you know, couldn't help but notice that we're in the midst of a pandemic. Um, my job would have been starting on June 1, where we were also in the midst of a very important national conversation around uh, systemic racism, particularly anti-Black racism, and what that means for uh, health. We were also beginning to get those first set of data showing us uh, the difference in outcomes across racial ethnic groups and geographic locations in our country and what uh, COVID-19 was doing differentially uh, in those neighborhoods. Nonetheless, I said, absolutely, I will come on this journey with you. Why? Well, public health is actually in my bones. Um, I grew up in a neighborhood where life and health were often endangered by uh, public health conditions. I couldn't quite understand um, how and what th that meant and, and what could be done about it until I found myself in an undergraduate program for public health where I got frameworks on which I could hang a lot of my early uh, experiences and really think about a career moving forward in public health. I also went on to do advanced training that gave me the credentials to now um, really feel as though I can lead us um, in a direction that will make us a real force um, in, in public health and having impact on people's lives. And as Dr. Wertheim said, you know, UC San Diego is the right place. We've got the right people, we have the right infrastructure, and we for sure have the right attitude. There's nothing like starting the job in the middle of a public health crisis to have you see not just where your strengths are, but where the potential uh, needs and gaps are uh, in, in your work environment. And I'll tell you, our strengths are such that uh, we work together, we work interdisciplinarily, we move quickly uh, when we need to, and we are a group of scholars who truly care about the impact that we're having on the communities around us. Now, we've also been able to see where um, we have needed to have more uh, resources poured into public health so that what's going on in our state, what's going on in our county uh, could be supported uh, in, a more, um, in a more intensive way uh, through decades long um, uh, resources that we haven't necessarily seen for public health. So that said, um, we are right now uh, in a place at UC San Diego where we're taking on the challenge of um, creating a footprint within our community where we robustly inform through a public health lens uh, with the people here on our campus in our health sciences uh, what this community can look like, what it can look like uh, with regards to behavioral health practices, taking care of our, our citizens in most need, those who may be unsheltered, who may be insecure in terms of uh, food, uh, individuals who have uh, mental health and, and mental illness concerns, and um, also those around us who have uh, lower socioeconomic uh, status related uh, health needs. We have the ability to think about the environment around us. You know, what do we see in terms of uh, pollution and uh, other uh, climate uh, related concerns that we as a school can begin to inform. Uh, I mentioned earlier, we're at a border community and we have the opportunity to robustly inform through a public health lens how uh, all of our citizens, whether uh, you migrate uh, daily or you think about uh, coming uh, onto U.S. soil for refuge, uh, how do we think about optimizing health in, in those contexts? And again, we'll be doing this across the lifespan, really um, living into that calling from uh, Dr. Wertheim to think about longevity and uh, the science of, of living well for a long time um, and doing that in its, in its most optimal form. So I thank you for you know, coming to hear about the exciting things that we're doing. I'd be happy to uh, give you some more specifics about how we're thinking about growing. As many of you know, um, we are opening the doors of the school this fall. Um, we will be uh, leveraging the nine programs that we already have in public health and in uh, preventive medicine. 
and we'll be preparing ourselves for accreditation. We will be starting a capital campaign to build a building. Um, we have put together an advisory board uh, that will help us. And thank you to those of you who may be on this call. I'm not sure if uh, Sally Hood and Hannah Johnson um, or Vanessa Wertheim are on right now. I think you may be. So thank you for, for joining the journey uh, to help inform the school and, and uh, serving in an advisory capacity. But we will uh, have lots of exciting, thought-provoking, inspiring things happening uh, over the next uh, few years. And thank you again for coming to hear about it, for being there to share our story and to support us. So at this time, I will uh, turn the microphone back over to Dr. Brenner. Well, I hope everyone can see why um, Chancellor Pradeep Khosla, Dr. Herbert Wertheim and I were so thrilled that um, Cheryl accepted our um, recruitment of her as the founding dean of the, um, the new school, Wertheim School of Public Health. So um, thank you, Cheryl, that was fantastic. Um, as I mentioned, we cannot have um, um, Council um, Supervisor Nathan Fletcher lie because of a media conflict, but he was able to get um, the questions you were asking and, and to respond to some. So we, we have his recording now and we'll listen to him and, and then we'll continue on with the, with the um, live discussion. So right now is um, Nathan Fletcher. He is our, our supervisor um, for the um, San Diego's fourth district. Um, he's also a member of the Governor's Council of Regional Homeless Advisors and Vice Chair of the Regional Task Force on the Homeless. Um, probably some of you don't know this, he's also um, has been a professor of practice in political science at UC San Diego since 2013. He teaches courses on public service, political science, um, the California government, and civil rights. Um, he's really been the, 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 the member of our government who has been most vocal, most seen uh, um, concerning um, major challenges like the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, in addition to his other areas he's championed, including um, mental health, um, climate change, um, crisis of um, migrant workers, um, homelessness, and um, health disparities. So now we have a message from, um, from Nathan Fletcher. Thanks. Hi, everyone. It's uh, Nathan Fletcher, County Supervisor. And uh, I wish I could be uh, with you live today, but I, I, I want to uh, really just take a moment and commend UC San Diego um, for everything that you've done to aid us through uh, the pandemic that we're going through. I have a scientific advisory panel uh, that is comprised of, of so many folks from UCSD that I rely on daily uh, to, uh, to help guide and shape the decisions we're making. Uh, obviously, your health system has been a vital component of what we're doing and just what you mean to the San Diego community. Uh, we are fortunate in San Diego to have one of the premier institutions in the world uh, when it comes to both healthcare, public health, uh, disease investigation, epidemiology, testing uh, right here in our backyard, and I count it as a great resource. Um, you know, we're, we're at, a, at, a, at a kind of second inflection point here in San Diego in, in responding to the COVID-19 pandemic, and I think that there are some things that we've done well. Uh, I think early as a county, we were one of the first counties to declare a public health state of emergency. Uh, we were one of the first counties to require mandatory face coverings. Uh, we moved swiftly, we moved fast, and we were one of the urban counties in California with some of the lowest case counts. Um, then came June, and I believe we made a mistake. I was very vocal and uh, was the lone no vote against expedited reopenings in June because I feared it would lead to an increase in cases that would cause us uh, to have to reimpose restrictions. Um, that unfortunately bore out to be true. Uh, and then I think the real tragedy of where we are today is that we repeated the mistake uh, of June, uh, again at the end of August with expedited reopenings, and now we're seeing our case count increase. You know, we're trying to deal with the global pandemic, which is always hard. Uh, I've read uh, a tremendous route around 1918, and we're going through many of the same struggles they did then. Uh, but we are trying to do it here in America at a point uh, where we are very divided as a country and, and issues of public health data and science have become partisan. If there was ever a time we needed to come together and work the problem based on data, this was it. Um, but unfortunately for both elected leaders and uh, a certain segment of your average population, that is challenging. Uh, we're also at a point where there's, there's very little trust in institutions uh, and trust in, in fact. And I think that all of those things are one of the reasons, that, along with the just erratic and unstable federal approach, uh, that, that the United States as a whole is struggling compared to others. 
Uh, so how do we get out of it? We just have to get up every single day and continue to push the message that we need to trust our public health experts. We need to trust the data. We need to trust the science. And whether you care primarily about saving lives or getting business back open, we do the exact same thing to accomplish both, which is slow the spread. And I will certainly continue to do that uh, as difficult as it may be as elected officials. I think we have that obligation, that burden uh, to confront uh, difficult situations and sometimes take unpopular positions because we believe it is right. But the other thing that I think is important as we move forward um, is, is in a real and substantive way uh, addressing the inequities that, that COVID-19 did not cause but has highlighted. Uh, and we have serious inequities uh, whenever it comes to access to health care, access to testing, uh, the impacts on education systems being changed uh, on lower income families, the impacts of a respiratory illness where we have a huge environmental justice and equity uh, of, of what zip codes have what level quality air. Uh, a child in Barrio Logan is eight times more likely to have asthma than a child in La Jolla. And we know based on a recent study, we've seen the higher mortality rate uh, of individuals from COVID uh, because of the air quality and the zip code they live in. Uh, we also know you're more likely to get COVID based on the zip code you live in. And, and tackling those inequities uh, is, is a part of an effort to try and build back better uh, in hopes that we come out of this stronger than we did before. I also think pre-COVID, my number one focus was issues of behavioral health, uh, mental health and, and drug treatment services, trying to rebuild that entire system. Uh, I think there's a better way we can, we can provide behavioral health services. And we've invested a lot of money as a county that I've spearheaded uh, around us rethinking and reimagining what those services look like, really embracing the opportunities uh, of telemedicine when appropriate uh, in terms of doing that. And so I think that we have uh, a lot of work uh, that, that we need to do um, in that regard as well. And, and, and then the, 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 the last point uh, that, that I, would, I would really say um, is, is just a broader uh, appreciation and value of public health as a whole. Uh, healthcare being a basic right, access to healthcare uh, being a basic component of what we do. And so my hope is, is that we continue to work our way through this. Uh, we can continue to rely on institutions like UC San Diego, and we can continue to listen uh, to actually hear the recommendations, the advice, the suggestions, uh, and build a broader base of support to translate that into policy. So um, I, I am grateful uh, to, to join you for just a few minutes. I will certainly download and watch the entirety of the discussion and conversation. Uh, and just my deepest appreciation and thanks to everyone uh, at UCSD for everything you're doing. So you, you can all see even this very brief presentation, how lucky we are to have Nathan Fletcher representing us and um, how engaged he is and um, what incredible fund of um, knowledge in, in, in multiple different um, areas. And, and um, one of which fortunately for us is public health. And he's really been championing this. Okay, now live, I can introduce um, really one of the um, distinguished um, national and international leaders in public health who's going to share um, his perspectives on COVID-19 and public health in general. This is Dr. Um, Harvey Feinberg. He's um, the president of the Gordon and, and Betty Moore Foundation and the chair for the U.S. National Academy's Standing Committee on Emerging Infectious Diseases and 21st Century Health Threats. Um, he was previously um, the president of um, the National Academy of Medicine, which used to be called the National Institute of, Med National Institute of Medicine. And before that, he was provost of um, Harvard University and dean of the Harvard Chan School of Public Health. Um, the very last person to give me a certificate was um, Dr. Feinberg when he gave me um, my certificate to um, join the uh, National Academy of uh, Medicine. So on a personal note, <laughs> and as well as, as a uh, first championship of public health, uh, I wanna thank Dr. Feinberg and turn it over to him. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, David. It's uh, such a pleasure to be with you and especially with Dean Anderson on this occasion. Uh, it's a great day for public health when the new wartime school was announced and now beginning to take shape under Cheryl Anderson's leadership. Uh, this is such a critical time uh, for the field. It's an opportunity and a need that UCSD is stepping forward to take up with the help of its supporters and friends. And it's a moment really of crisis for our nation and indeed for the world. Uh, public health has this perspective on the health of 
an entire population, it does have this perspective of a global outreach and inclusion of all peoples. It emphasizes the kind of preventive measures that uh, Dean Anderson so eloquently described. And I have to say, just as an aside, I was kind of thrilled to hear how in your thinking and planning, you're going to be taking advantage of the special resources that distinguish the San Diego community and the university in its capacity to respond. Of course, it's phenomenal biomedical strengths. In addition, the proximity to other great institutions like Scripps, but that give you a leg up on climate change and health. The notion that you can really come to grips with migrant health and population uh, health demands because of the special positioning geographically uh, that, uh, that you occupy. All these and many more ways that this School of Public Health can distinguish itself along with the core requirement in its very definition that it's focusing on healthy years of life, longevity, long and healthy lives. We used to joke that the job in public health was to help everyone die young as late as possible. <laughs> and that idea that we are healthy as long as possible is really at the heart of public health. And it is at a time like this that the usually invisible fundamental workings of public health abruptly come to the fore. In the face of an emerging infection like SARS coronavirus 2 and the disease COVID-19, everyone who is aware at all understands the fundamental importance of public health, both as a way to understand and apprehend the problem, and more importantly, as an organizing set of principles to respond, to prevent additional cases, to provide the care, protection, and reduction in the burden of this disease, and ultimately to provide the vaccines and other preventives that will help bring this to a close. COVID is really multiple crises wrapped up together. Uh, COVID is a personal health crisis whenever it strikes us or a member of our family. It is a medical crisis because of the burden that the numbers of cases of COVID and frankly, the numbers of other diseases secondarily neglected because of COVID and its ways it's stressing our society also add to the burden of health. It's a public health crisis because of the strain that it is putting on our public health institutions, on the ability of our nation and our communities, our states to respond effectively. It's obviously an economic crisis uh, because of the displacement of work, the loss of incomes, the failures of our ability to get back to work. And it's a social crisis. It's a crisis of relationship. It's a crisis of confidence. It's a crisis of understanding, communication, of leadership. It's a crisis that affects our nation internally and also affects how we deal with others in the world. It's a test of the United States, of our public health infrastructure, our scientific capacity, our medical care response, our social fabric of connectedness one to another in order to manage our way through these multiple intersecting and interlocking crises. At the heart of it has been and will be public health, public health in its capacity and in its ability to respond. I know, David, there are a number of questions that uh, have come forward, and I'm very happy to be able to join with you and with Dean Anderson in responding as appropriate. 
So let me turn back to you for guidance through our Q&A part of this session. Thank you so much. Okay, so um, there are a lot, a lot of questions about COVID-19, but I, I, before I get carried away, I, I just wanted to take advantage of, uh, of Harvey for, for advice about the school. <laughs> so so we're, we're gonna get lots of COVID-19 questions. I have a whole list that are coming up every second now. But before that, um, what advice do you have for our chancellor, for me, for, and for, for Dean Anderson? Um, about a new school of public health. When we were first starting this, I went on a listening tour and went to several deans and they were all incredibly jealous. They said, David, if I was gonna start a school again, I'd do it completely differently. I wouldn't organize it among required disciplines and departments. I would do it, I would organize it among, you know, areas of mutual interest or areas that the school would be really outstanding at. So I can't think of anyone else to give us some fatherly advice, <laughs> Dr. Feinberg. Well, I'm really uh, thrilled. First, let me say there's nothing as exciting and promising as a new venture <laughs> because you get to start with a blank slate. So your great asset is you've got no preconceived, prepositioned, fixed problems that you have to push aside. Your problem is you have nothing to build on yet. Everything is going to come afresh. And so the choices that you make right now, which may seem like they're, you know, 55, 45 close calls. How do we move? Who do we bring? Where do we go? In another couple of years, it's going to be almost unthinkable that you could have done it any other way. So these choices are really going to set uh, a pathway. Uh, that implies, insofar as you can, actually keeping flexibility and, and, and a notion that over time we will learn things that will make us want to adjust. Let's retain this sense of adventure and flexibility. I think that's a very important kind of fundamental philosophy to bring to this. Now, uh, if you can avoid the sorts of rigidity that traditional academic departments, for example, impose within a school, it can be very advantageous in terms of assembling, reassorting, and recomposing groups focused on critical problems. At the same time, you have to manage this, the degree of stability and the progression of career for the exciting, talented young people that you're going to want to attract along with some of your more seasoned figures in the university community who can help add a kind of experience and uh, savvy to the uh, environment of the school, you're going to need to have a way to recognize and move them forward. Every choice will have this kind of advantage and the kind of uh, responsive uh, need to compensate for whatever you're missing out by the first choice you've made. I love the prospect. I just think you're, you've got uh, so many opportunities that uh, the, the challenge is going to be deciding in a way what not to do as much as deciding what to do. And I'll just say one other aside to Dean Anderson and then I'll, re I'll relent. <laughs> if you don't put forward your agenda, others will put it forward for you. No, no pressure. <laughs> so that just means that you need, you, of course, you'll have an open mind. You want to hear from everybody. Uh, at a certain point, though, people will fill a void. So keeping that right tempo between listening, synthesizing, and pushing forward, that's the task that a dean has that is rather special compared to the intellectual, academic, and teaching role that we're accustomed to uh, in most of our careers in academia. So this is the transition uh, to becoming a dean. It's that balance of listening and leading. Thank you, Harvey. Beautiful. I'm, I'm going to ask um, a, a vice chancellor question. I promise I won't do it again. And okay. I know I'm going to go to the list. But, but just <laughs> one quick question, because I have you both. Um, one of the things I was always impressed about about UC San Diego was how um, collaborative we are and how we're willing to do um, interdisciplinary research, interdisciplinary programs, which 
I did not get when I was in the East Coast schools, which I felt were much more siloed, you know, m much more protecting their turf. Now that we have a new School of Public Health, I, I want to hear from both of you. What would be your suggestion for what would you, who would you like to bring into public health that's not in public health? This is an opportunity to do cluster hires, to get joint appointments in public health and something else. What would you like to see happen with that? I'll, I'll, I'll let Cheryl go first. Right. Yeah, Cheryl should uh, the, dean, the dean can go first. The dean can pull Absolutely. <laughs> and, I, and I have some, some institutional advantage here. Yes. So one of the things that strikes me uh, in our, our well, what, what used to be our department and what will now be our school is the fact that we haven't really leveraged being like a stone's throw away from our academic medical center. I mean, our hospital is within walking distance of many of our offices. And the ability to do health services research that really takes what our hospital is trying to do with its population health initiative, where we're moving more and more services into a community-based space. We're really thinking about not just uh, bringing people into the hospital, but what their lives look like in the between hospital visit space and doing that in a way that is um, in true partnership. When we do uh, healthcare programs in our community, there should be public healthcare programs going alongside them um, as well. And so I have been really looking forward to thinking through what a learning healthcare system looks like with CEO Mason and um, the new CMO Parag Agnatori, because they are marching forward, I think, in the right direction around population health initiatives and uh, we need to be right alongside them. So if I were to think about a truly transformative hire, um, David, that we don't currently have on the campus, it would be uh, someone who uh, legitimately sits in a hospital you know, embedded uh, care um, practice, as well as being solidly well-trained in health services research and helping us do that crosstalk uh, effectively. That's a great answer too. Uh, should, I would just add, if I may, David, for a moment, I would say, you know, one of the wonderfully defining features of public health is that it's, it's fundamentally a problem-oriented field. Uh, public health draws upon whatever discipline, whether ancient or contemporary, whatever way of thinking, whether it's the systems thinking of engineering or the causal thinking of epidemiology, or a philosophy of values, all of these things are in service to solving the problem of the population health need. So a school of public health can be a kind of crossroads for any component of the university, whether it's engineering or medicine or political science or you name it, who have a voice and a vision and something to contribute to the solution to those problems, to the advancement of health. I love the idea of serving as a kind of complementary force for those who are not yet in the health system because population health embraces those who are getting care and those who are in need but not yet getting their care. So this notion where you can position public health as the crossroads focused on solving problems and embracing the whole of the population could serve you Im immensely well and could become also a primary arm of the university's interface to its public community and leadership in the surround. Public health could be the leading force for intersection and interaction with your uh, political leaders, including people as talented and as knowledgeable as Nathan, as we just all saw. And so this could be another special feature of what UCSD public health means in a new 21st century vision of public health. There's a similar question from um, the audience from E. Benton for, um, for Cheryl. And, and that is, um, are there specifics that you wanna share with us about the um, the school of public health, whether they're you know the educational or research or areas that you wanted us to know about. Yeah, absolutely. So while we are um, just a real 
treasure trove in terms of what we offer educationally. And this has happened over some time, right? Um, we have been building a PhD level uh, training in public health where we offer specialties in epidemiology, health behavior, as you heard from uh, Nathan Fletcher, how important it is to really think about behavioral health in today's, um, in today's society, as well as global health. And we are looking um, quite actively at building out another doctoral program in public health because that will be necessary for our uh, accreditation in a few years. Uh, so that's something that as we strategically think about next steps, we're going to want to align where we go with our research programs um, with what, we'll get, what we're gonna be doing in the classroom. We have also just grown tremendously in the space of bioinformatics, data science, biostatistics uh, over the last few years. And uh, I would like to see us be able to do that UCSD um, interdepartment, department uh, inter-unit collaboration that we're so good at um, with our bioinformatics group that sits in our hospital. With our data science group, we've got the Halashiglu uh, Data Science Center across campus where we've already in the last few years done cross hiring and really become a force in uh, what we can do uh, with data science. Because as Dr. Feinberg pointed out, you know, being able to solve some of these problems means bringing the best minds to the table. And um, what I love about working in public health is that um, those best minds don't necessarily have to be trained in public health science. They need to complement what we do in public health science, but the broader um, the thinking that we have, the better the solutions that we usually end up with. So David, I'm really excited about you know, where we are. We've got a lot of active programs and we do need to consciously, strategically bring forward a new one to the table. And um, I'm excited about what that could possibly be. Very good, okay. What do you think the next topic is? <laughs> you only get one, one guess. There are really 20 questions on <laughs> vaccines. They range from everything from when it'll be available, how we know it's safe, to, to, to very sort of like, you know, public health issues about how do you distribute it? How do you make sure everyone gets it? And, and then there are these interesting, you know, questions about uh, opposition to vaccines and Americans lost in confidence, loss of confidence in science and, you know, and also we have a tradition of anti-vaccine sort of, you know, um, ideas. So, so I, I'd like to hear you both, but, but maybe this time we should switch the order and let, let Harvey go first. And, and, and then Cheryl, can, whatever Harvey forgets to say, Cheryl can say. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, this is, of course, a, a huge, but also immensely timely and highly relevant uh, topic. The first observation I would make is that in incredible speed with which the research enterprise in so many institutions in the United States, indeed around the world, have moved forward in creating candidates for a vaccine. This is really unprecedented. And whatever else we, we talk about now in terms of the vaccine evaluations and production and deployment, uh, that achievement scientifically is going to go down in history as one of the remarkable accelerants that were responses to this COVID crisis. So uh, we have to acknowledge that uh, right off the bat. Secondly, uh, we're in the midst now of clinical trials of a number of vaccine candidates in the US and uh, Europe, at least three that are moving into uh, the uh, stage three trials. The San Diego community is involved in some of these research trials. The key thing about a vaccine trial, and you know, there's several stages. There's the pure safety stage. There's the stage at which you determine the dosage and what, whether it's uh, reasonable to proceed. And then you have the actual trial, which we're embarked on on these leading candidates. That requires that you have enough people immunized and enough people with the uh, you know, sham vaccine, the placebo, uh, that as people become infected, you can begin to differentiate statistically in the way uh, Cheryl was describing the biostatistical, bio, uh, bioinformatics uh, importance, differentiate those who had been immunized from those who have not. So that's going on right now. That takes time. 
it takes more time as the epidemic subsides because you take longer for enough people to be differentially infected to demonstrate whether the vaccine has or has not made a difference. What we're looking for is a vaccine that has at least 50% efficacy. What does that mean? It means if you immunize 15,000 people and had 15,000 otherwise, and in the 15,000 not immunized, let us say 500 were infected, if 250 in the immunized group were infected, that's considered a 50% protection. That's what we are at the minimum seeking. Another point very important in a vaccine that is going to be rapidly deployed is post-market surveillance for the long-term safety and detection of rare but important side effects. This is going to be especially important in this accelerated stage. As far as priorities, the National Academy of Sciences is actually producing a report that should be out very soon, a preliminary uh, I would say draft was released for public comment just a, a week or two ago, very soon to lay out priorities within the US. But finally, I would just say uh, the number of vaccine candidates, the number of people who should get it is going to exceed the capacity in the early stage of production, even as the government has done the smart but uh, unprecedented thing of paying for the manufacturer in advance of vaccine candidates, even before we know if that vaccine is going to be useful, because if it is useful, we want to have it readily available. If it's not, well, uh, think of it as an insurance investment that we made and the house didn't burn down this year, so we still paid that insurance. Uh, now, it's going to take time for those uh, vaccines to be administered and the final point, the greatest weakness in this whole chain from basic research to protection is that last mile of actual immunization of people who should be immunized, which ultimately is going to include virtually all of us, but begins with the highest priority, health workers, those in uh, congregate living, those who are in high risk groups and so on. So uh, realistically, this is a 2021 game. Uh, it's really not going to have much of a start, if at all, before the end of this uh, current year. But we can hope if the vaccines are successful, as the production ramps up, that next year will be a very important year of progress in prevention of COVID. Thank you. Shall you also particularly address, because um, this is more your area, um, acceptance of a vaccine? How do you get, how do you how do you create that? Yeah, absolutely. Well, first of all, beautiful summary of, you know, what we have ahead of us, um, Harvey. Thank you for that. And, you know, so we have, uh, as someone asked in the question, you know, situation of, do people trust science? Do people trust our leadership um, around, you know, COVID-19 efforts? And that issue of trust is not something that you can regain very quickly. And we noticed even right here in our great state of California that there was an anti-vaccination movement happening uh, to the extent where we had to create state policy around childhood vaccinations to ensure that we wouldn't have massive outbreaks of things like measles, you know, mumps um, in, our, in our schools. And so I think the time is now um, as we're seeing the signals uh, and hearing the, the American public say to us, you know, that we will not necessarily trust you that this vaccine is going to be necessarily good for me and, 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 and my family, um, to begin those educational and, um, and, and public health efforts that will get people to really understand what the vaccine does and why it is important in our very small individual action um, to do these things like get vaccinated for greater community health. So if, if there is you know, any one thing that this is, has highlighted for me, it's that just very fundamental public health concept of um, what you do as an individual may have a very small impact individually, but when you 
look at that on a population scale, it can be quite remarkable in terms of reducing morbidity and mortality from various things. It plays out time and time again. So, you know, our public health workforce and leadership and our national leadership will really need to get um, ahead of this because uh, we have to uh, begin to rebuild trust. We have to go into communities and really do the hard stakeholder work of uh, letting people know what is going on, why it is really important, and uh, getting ahead of some of these um, pushbacks and anti-vaccination um, efforts. Yeah. Um, Paul Citron, who is a, um, on our advisory board, is a very famous um, engineer, member of National Academy of Engineers, um, asked the very same question that the chair will sort of address, I want to see what Harvey says about how, is there something specifically we can do to rebuild confidence in, um, um, the community's confidence in scientific advice as it relates to public health. Is there some actions that we should be doing that we're not doing? This is a huge challenge, you know, and it's much deeper even than COVID. It, it has to do with public confidence in expertise, in science, in engineering, in those who have the savvy and knowledge uh, and the judgment to be able to bring to public attention, to our leaders' attention, genuine challenges and solutions uh, in both ways. How to rebuild this is such uh, a real and important uh, challenge. I think it starts, frankly, with our education system. Uh, it has to start with our schools and uh, giving everyone a better appreciation for what science is and what science does, and indeed for the uncertainties remaining as science progresses, because as we all uh, know from experience, every new discovery, every new advance opens up additional questions and raises into, the, uh, into visibility those uncertainties. But having confidence in what science can convey and recognizing where the uncertainties still remain. That's a very hard job of communication that those who are in science, engineering, and the fields of expertise uh, who want to provide this public service, we all need to keep practicing and trying to master this ability with, as uh, Dean Anderson pointed out early for public health, with the right humility about what uh, is at that time knowable and what we need still to do to learn more. So it's a really big, really important question and it's going to be with us long after COVID is a, a threat. May I add one, um, one thing to what you just said um, because it, it reminded me that you know, if we not only thought about this from an education perspective, but systematically put into, for me, the vision is here in higher education, but I'd like for us to systematically infuse college education with a public health 101 um, training. So no one should be graduating UC San Diego without having you know, public health 101. Now that public health 101 course, because we are so digitally savvy, can be recorded it can be made available to everyone in the state. It could be made available to people across the country, across the world, and it can be connected to the various things that we're experiencing in public health at that time. So for example, right now, you know, we connect it to the various parts of the conversation that are important with COVID-19 mitigation and control. And I think a more informed public um, that really gets the fundamental things that are required for all of us to be engaged in as we try to solve public health problems could be one step in the right direction. I agree with Harvey, this is such a persistent and difficult um, challenge, but um, systematically, I think education um, could begin to, to get some of this going. The, the last couple of minutes, there are a lot of very specific questions about um, UC San Diego and COVID-19. So, so maybe I'll ask Cheryl to answer. So if this is a basketball game, um, Cheryl can do the play-by-play -play and Harvey can do the color commentary, okay? All right. All right. Okay, so the first question is, um, what's the protocol for um, COVID-19 testing of UC San Diego students? 
And if they're positive, what does quarantine look like? Yeah, great question. Um, so as everyone knows, you know, we decided to be pioneers around uh, thinking about living alongside the virus in the campus environment. And we uh, now have come to the place where on Saturday, our students uh, will begin to move back to campus. This will happen in a staged way so that we have a uh, few hundred coming in over the next 14 days each day. The testing uh, happens at the point of move-in to the campus. Uh, if a positive result emerges from that test, our students will be placed in isolation housing and we've set aside uh, single use unit housing uh, for individuals in this circumstance where they have 24 hour wraparound services, they have daily wellness checks, and uh, we have support services, for example, if there are errands that need to be run, if there are uh, you know, engagements that need to be uh, shuffled around um, so that you can successfully get through isolation, then those things are managed um, with the student. We also have procedures for any close contacts of those who have a positive test result because they will need to be in quarantine. And again, we've set aside quarantine uh, housing specifically for this, this purpose with the same amount of wraparound services to really understand what barriers there might be to quarantining and providing solutions, offering uh, housing and dining services, uh, meals delivered, things of that nature. So it is a, a pretty well thought through um, service. At the end of the, the isolation and quarantine period, our students will be retested. So this is within 10 to 14 days um, after quarantine started. Uh, before they uh, sort of move in officially uh, to their college fall experience. We, we have time for one more question. Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll start with Harvey and, and then have, and then have um, Cheryl comment. So this is from um, Donna Dabiri and she asked, is there, are there specific things, outreach things we should be doing to address um, millennials, to educate them about COVID-19 in particular from um, um, disadvantaged um, um, communities that, that, that try to be, teach them to be more protective, to, to help them. A, a, any specific points we should use, uh, Harvey and then Cheryl. As a general observation in public health communication, we know you have to reach out to people where they live, where they dwell, where they look for uh, contact communication. So if you're trying to reach a certain age group, you need to start with well, how does that age group communicate with one another? What, do, what vehicles are they using? And what media in particular do they turn to? Because that's the vehicle that you should in turn be using. If you're trying to reach a community where the most trusted and common institution is the church, well, you go to the churches and you go to our religious leaders and you enlist them in support of the kind of community-based messaging that people need. So the general principle is you start with the, the media and the places and the messengers who are already the most trusted for the group you're trying to reach. And I would just add um, to that response that you know, our young people are in a phase of life where um, risk-taking and you know, uh, behaviors that we wouldn't necessarily engage in in other stages of our lives are more prominent. And so providing resources to really support them in making the right decisions are also key. I want to thank um, both our live speakers, <laughs> Harvey Feinberg and Cheryl Anderson, as well as our recorded speakers, um, Nathan Fletcher and Harvey Wertheim. I'm gonna do the one thing I know I'm supposed to do for um, my own health. I'm running across the street to get my flu vaccine right now. Very good. So I, I, and if anyone else has, has trouble getting a flu vaccine, I want you to contact me directly, anyone in our audience and I, and I will arrange it. So that, that will be my contribution to your health care. <laughs> you guys were well, fantastic. This is such a pleasure. Thank, thank you so much. And, mm -hmm. and thank you audience for participating. We're gonna sign off now and everyone stay um, um, healthy and safe. Thank you. Mm -hmm.